Hello everyone, welcome to a exciting episode of Conversational Pace. We have the North Face Alta Mesa 500. Finn, I think this is a new brand. We've never done a North Face shoe. Fun fact, by the way, like uh, the last North Face shoe that I ran in before this Alta Mesa 500 was uh, part of the Vective Flight series. I, I ran the 2021 UTMB CCC back there in one of the Vectives, so... Was it the carbon one? Pretty cool. Sorry. Was it the carbon one? It was the carbon one. Yeah. Did you, did your ankles survive? They did. Wow. That's amazing. They did. Yeah. I don't know. It it ended up being, I think I was, I was caught up in all the rage about it. Like my local brick and mortar store was selling it. And I was like, yeah, at that point I was, yeah. When the Vective series initially came out, like I was still working at Rogue Valley Runners and like 2020, 2021, we got some like early sample units. Um, and I was absolutely a hundred percent sipping the, the like carbon plated trail shoe Kool-Aid until I just like effed my ankle so bad and was like, <laughs> I am so done with carbon plates being right under my foot. And, and it was kind of a narrower shoe too. So then I was just like always so scared to run in that shoe, but I liked the shape and the feel of it. Um, I was just hoping for some, I don't know, some more upgraded midsole foams, which is what North Face has been cooking up the last few years. So in the Ultimate 500, this is a, this is kind of an athlete driven shoe. Um, a lot of their athletes love the Vective Pro and now the Vective Pro 2, which is a carbon plated kind of their trail racer. It's pretty aggressive though. They wanted a shoe that had basically the same foam, but without the plate and a little bit more relaxed fit. So they started getting to work. And as a result, the Ultimate 500 was born. So pretty cool to get like that North face was able to like churn out a shoe like this and, you know, a year, year and a bit, um, directly from athlete feedback. So I like, I just like hearing stories like that from, from these brands. Um, I guess before we get going, I'm a little late to the disclaimer. I forgot, but that's okay. These shoes were provided to us by North face and running warehouse, but we're under no financial obligation to say whether we like these shoes or not, because we want to keep these reviews authentic and beneficial for you. No one will get to preview or watch this footage before it gets published to YouTube. Yeah, I guess we'll do a quick run through of the shoe stats. $155 USD for the shoe. My pair came in at 315 grams, 11.1 ounces, and that's in a US size 10. We're looking 32 millimeters of stack in the forefoot, 38 millimeters in the heel for a, huh, I wrote down eight millimeter drop, but huh. doing some public math, that's actually six, six millimeter drop. And, you know, this is very much like we're throwing this one right in that, you know, maximal stack height trail shoe type category materials. We're looking at a engineered mesh upper that has varying kind of densities throughout the upper um kind of almost to serve as overlays so you can see that some of the the knit is tighter right around the the midfoot and going into the forefoot and then it's a little bit more relaxed up on the top of the toe box as well as some more open mesh panels around the midfoot as well they do still include a few plastic overlays around the laces around the midfoot and then kind of like a medium strength toe bumper like it gives the gives the shoe or the toe box some shape but i wouldn't go kicking rocks in it because you can indent it pretty easily kind of like a hybrid style lacing system there's some classic eyelets but then there's like a couple gilly style laces towards the top the tongue i wrote down that this tongue is about the thinnest padded tongue you could get while still it qualifying as a padded tongue because It technically is more than just a piece of fabric, but man, it's like they put like a like a piece of tissue paper in the middle yep. there. Um, it is a gusseted tongue. What else do we got? Pretty uh, pretty classic, um, like stiff heel cup. It you know gives it some nice shape and support. Medium amount of foam around the ankle and the heel, and it's pretty soft. And they actually put in like. Kudos to North Face for putting in a like mega soft material on the interior, which is kind of nice. And also, I always appreciate a, a classic pull tab uh, around there. I think that's pretty much it for the for the upper. Did I miss anything? No. Yeah, that's pretty good. The midsole is North Face's dream foam. 
and that is a super critical EVA. I couldn't find if it was an EVA blend, like running in it and squishing it and feeling it. It just doesn't quite feel like a just a only EVA. I don't know. That's just the conspiracy theorist in me being like, this has got to be some sort of plastic like TPE EVA blend. Anyways, it's the same foam as what we see in the the Vective Pro shoe, which is their carbon plated racer. Apparently it's just a direct takedown to it, which is pretty cool to see. It's just one massive slab of it. There's no additional plates or anything in this shoe. You just get a big old hunk of super critical foam, which is pretty sweet. Um, this foam probably compares it very it compares very closely to DNA loft foam that we see in the Brooks Caldera, which we uh, recently reviewed. Similar ingredients. This is just like North Face's take on it. I guess to go along with the midsole, this shoe has a, a very long rocker, which is interesting. So the, the Vective Pro actually has a very short rocker. Um, I'd be curious to talk to the designers like as to why. So the Vective Pro stays pretty flat on the ground up yeah. until about the ball of your foot. And then it just like half pipes it. Whereas this one actually goes, the, the rocker starts like, gosh, like barely past the midpoint of the shoe and is very sloped and long, um, kind of like a Hoka speed goat. What are the pros and cons there? Would you say? I've always just thought is it's like, I, I would love to know like the, the, yeah, the, I don't know what the pros and cons are other than it's just a different feel, like more technical running. I don't like a really long rocker. I want more surface area of the shoe touching the ground. So I either want like a thinner shoe, no rocker, or if it is a thicker shoe, I want a very late rocker. Um, I think the Hoka Mafate has a, a late rocker like that, which I prefer that for more technical running. For more mellow running, I like that long rocker, like this shoe. Um, same with the Hoka Speed Goat. I feel like it helps my foot transition from like heel or midfoot to toe uh, with much less effort than normal. So yep. perhaps it's this. They went for the long rocker on the shoe just because of the intended purpose of the shoe and you know where they expect you to be running in it. The outsole is North Face's own in-house uh, surface control rubber. I don't know. It seems pretty basic. Like I, it doesn't seem like special, but it also doesn't seem crappy. Four millimeter lugs. It's, it's two different pieces um, with a decent amount of exposed midsole. I think because this midsole foam doesn't, it doesn't get destroyed, you know, like some of the other more fragile PIBA based foams. Um, there's a pretty good sized chunk cut out right under the midfoot. And what I learned for that was it's, it does save a little bit of weight, but um, when this was filled in and their initial testing, the shoe was really stiff under, mm -hmm. under the midfoot. So they wanted to increase that torsional flexibility a little bit um, for when you are out on the trail. So just cutting a little chunk out um, seemed to torsional, <laughs> torsional, <laughs> torsional flexibility. <laughs> Sometimes you got to take something away to gain something, you know. <laughs> Finn, what kind of what kind of running did you get in at this one? 117 miles in this shoe. I've been training for Cocodona, so went a little bit over. Ended up being a great like off day Cocodona training shoe if I was kind of going on like city adventures. But I also took it on sort of light to moderate trails. I did split the mileage about fifty fifty, like fifty percent being road, fifty percent being trail because i think that this is this is a pretty bread and butter road the trail shoe so I, I felt obligated to be almost equally on both surfaces how about you yeah i feel like north face didn't really put too much door to trail literature in the marketing for this shoe but this is very much an amazing door to trail shoe i did some you know road only runs in the shoe like i just did door to door <laughs> and this is great like if they slapped a road outsole on this shoe this would be such a nice, like just mileage totally. shoe for the roads. Totally. Um, they wouldn't have to change the thing. But anyway, so I got in 76 miles on the shoe. I fell a little bit behind schedule last week, uh, crewing at Lululemon's further event. I was so naive thinking I'd be able to get in time to run, but uh, I was far too tired for that. Um, so yeah, 76 miles, about 12 and a half hours worth of running and just over 12,000 feet of climbing. So took it, took it through the paces. Um, yeah, and it was probably probably ran like twenty five, thirty percent of my miles were paved, and then the rest was dry, 
either hard packed or kind of loose dry single track trail i i did get in a couple palm springs um trail runs so i got to put it on some slightly rockier um you know almost like you know your arizona phoenix type trails um so i feel like i i really i took the shoe in probably a lot of the terrains that it was it was designed for mm. what did you think of i guess for one like like the length the width the fit yeah you know i was telling you offline it, maybe it was yesterday you and i were talking i think the geometry of this shoe is really interesting like instead of cuz this does fit like a a higher volume wider foot pretty naturally and instead of like a sort of a foot shaped toe box that you would see to accommodate that this shoe instead sort of like it there's like some bust on both sides while it still kind of narrows at the top of the forefoot and it like in my experience it does a great job of allowing the big toe and the pinky toe to splay and achieve some of what like a foot shaped toe box would do for all toes but like those two i guess being the most critical in their mind so that was really interesting i think it also made like this shoe, a great stability option as well. Like I felt like, um, I don't know if it was the Caldera we were talking about this with, but like sort of that Brooks guide rail technology. I felt mm -hmm. like this shoe had some of that feature to it. I think for the type of shoe this is, I really, I like the wideness in the forefoot. I like the wideness back in the heel for, again, for stability. I think that when you, like for me running on both trails and on roads, like when you land on, a variety of these surfaces i think the shoe performs like as it aspires to being stability based and there isn't much like collapsing inward or outward on it like i felt like pretty good ankle stability which was great um i think it's also a shoe that is designed to be like out of the box ready like it's a pretty accommodating upper fit like i love the materials you talked about the tongue earlier i think that was a great feature um no break in needed instant comfort i think drawbacks like i can see like i have a like a, i think i have a higher volume foot like a sort of i need like a wider toe box i can see how like and i didn't do this but like if you did go into technical terrain with this shoe i can see how with this upper like it could affect lacing it could affect lockdown um i can't personally vouch for that either way but <clears throat> i did see some youtube videos out there and some write-ups that like made that complaint and then I think in general, like if you, and maybe, you know, we can talk about this more when we get to sort of like the, the ride portion of it. But I think this is another shoe where like, depending on what size foot you are, it drastically changes your experience all around with the shoe. So that might be worth more getting into when we get to sort of the ride of the shoe and um, like the stack of the shoe and, and, and the foam and whatnot. But um, those were some initial impressions for me. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like a lot of what you said about kind of the fit and the feel. And yeah, I thought the shape of the shoe was inch is unique. Like, I don't think we've had any high stack shoes like this that are shaped this way. And I don't know if that's just North face and it being a new shoe and them just building it kind of weird, but it's very, um, it has a big curve to it. Like you can see from heel to toe, like it's got a lot of curve to it. And usually what when you see a curvy shoe like this you usually see them on like a lower stack height racing shoe like mm -hmm. a racing flat like the old school racing flats were very curvy why did they do that i think it was because you could get a little bit more exact fit around the curvature of like your like what was back in the day your standard racing foot which was like you know, you're kind of your high arched runner because yeah. this this shoe very much fits the shape of what a, like a higher arched person's foot might look like, um, which I thought was kind of interesting. Usually you see a shoe like this and it's a little bit straighter lasted. Like, while I would say the shoe is definitely as wide as the Caldera um, in the forefoot, where your toes then hit the toe box it's in a very different spot which i just thought was interesting like for my slightly narrower foot it was totally fine but i thought it was interesting yeah like you said like the the shoe is very wide like yeah. right at the right at the forefoot you know by the ball of your foot selectively yeah it's wide yeah. there but then we do have kind of a weirdly tapered toe box which i think for some is going to fit just fine but if you're looking for 
that round toe box, you know, like a topo or an ultra, yeah. even though you get that similar width right at the forefoot, you're not going to get that in the toes. So like, if you're looking for like maximal toe splay, this isn't your shoe. If, if, you know, you've worked just fine in like the Nike Zagama, the Hoka Spiga, the Brooks Caldera, I don't think the fit of the shoe is going to be an issue at all. Um, I would be curious. I could see like those who have more like like flatter feet, lower arches, um, might run into some fit issues with this shoe. Um, it wouldn't surprise me at all if the flatter foot tends to drift more to the lateral side of the shoe. Um, you see that a lot in kind of curvier shoes, like um, where you know even though it's wide enough, you might have like extra bunching around the ball of the foot and all of your foot is pushing way up against the pinky toe side of oh, things. Yeah. Um, and that's just a problem with like the, it's not, and some people say then, oh, the shoe's too narrow. It's like, no, your foot's just not sitting on the shoe correctly. So this might be a bit of a like hit or miss type shoe for, for some people who are like on the very extreme edges of the narrow or wide spectrum. But I think for kind of your classic medium width foot, this is going to work pretty well. Um, I did notice that the forefoot, um, it's pretty high volume of material. So like I, I had a quite a bit of bunching of the material up top. Um, it wasn't a problem. It was just like there. And I was like, oh, if I were building this upper, I would probably use a little bit less material um, up top. But overall, I thought the upper like was very much like it was adequate. It was fine for yeah. me. Like it was good enough. Um, I'm not, I'm definitely not going to say like, this is the most comfortable upper I've ever worn. Cause it wasn't, but it also wasn't uncomfortable at all either. Yeah. Um, I had no issues with the heel and the ankle collar. I actually thought those were very comfortable. I had no slippage at all. I didn't even have to use the the top eyelet. Um, I never, I never messed with the lacing. I thought that was you never cool. did either. I thought the lockdown was actually very good going down steeper stuff. Like my foot didn't slide forward where I thought the lockdown lacked was on the lateral movement. So where North Face has put in, you know, their denser material for their overlays instead of plastic, I don't think they worked that well because like even if I'm taking a switchback faster or running on any sort of off cambered trail, my foot would slide quite a bit. Like that I I I very much felt like like in the very forefoot, like I thought this just kind of felt like a road shoe in the yeah. front. Like on on more mild you know or moderately technical terrain or anything where i'm moving a little bit more side to side my foot was all over the place in this but just like bombing straight down straight down something it was actually fine like i thought it was totally good so again kind of just like perhaps maybe it's just a year one sort of miss on some of the parts of the shoe mm. um yeah, I think those are all my notes that I wrote down for the for the upper. It was kind of a mouthful, but I think that's oftentimes what happens um huh. with with new models of shoes. There's like a lot of like little nitpicky things. Yep. Um especially with North Face because they've historically made like really crappy shoes and they're like right on the verge of being excellent. So I'm gonna be extra critical. One might even say I'm being super critical of <laughs> Of their fit, um, because I want them to succeed. I want them to succeed and make some great shoes. Um, let's move on to like the the midsole, outsole, underfoot sure. feel. I mean, the 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 biggest thing that sticks out for me with this shoe is there is little to no ground feel, and in this this mm -hmm. shoe that we've reviewed might be like the least ground feely shoe that we have reviewed to date there is a lot of shoe underfoot like it's truly like a max beefy high stack cushion shoe and it's um, not that soft and it's not that soft exactly it's not that soft um and you don't need a rock plate like there's plenty of cushion um i would say like a pretty adaptable feel to like it felt as plush on on road and gravel as it did on trail i did see a lot of like comments on social media for this shoe that like out of the box it's amazing like there's a very plush feel and that the foam will start to settle about two to three runs in and then it sort of like sticks there for the first whatever 100 to 200 miles i definitely did feel that like i can corroborate like that experience um really similar actually and i can't remember which which foam the ultra forward experience was using but like i had the same 
first two to three run feel in the forward experience that I had in this shoe, which I thought was like hmm. really interesting. interesting. It's, it's, it's a hard, it's other than that, like a very hard shoe to compare this to. I wrote down in my notes that like, I, I was under the impression just based on research that like, if you're using like a super critical EVA blended foam, like this shoe is, it is going to break down quicker than traditional EVA. But I think you corrected me there. Like that's actually not the case, right? No, like the process that they're using to make these supercritical foams, like it's hard to compare because in the EV, in the pre supercritical foam world, um, most shoe companies didn't even bother to make a pure EVA shoe like this soft yeah. because they couldn't tune the EVA to give it these kinds of properties where it's like, if you made it this much rebound and put this much air in between like the cells of foam then it would break down in like a hundred miles. Mm. So then they're like, okay, well, how do we get it to last for 300 miles? Oh, okay. We need to make it denser and firmer. And if you did that to this foam and made it even denser, it would last like two or three times longer than your traditional EVA. So while this might be getting the same mileage out of like your old school EVA, you get a much more pleasant ride for all 300 of those miles. Yeah. And you know, I think you're going to get a little bit higher quality. I mean, yeah, you get, you get a higher quality ride for the same amount of miles. So like, mm -hmm. I don't know, in my mind, that's a fair trade off because why would you want to run 300 miles in a shoe that feels like crap? I'd rather run 300 miles in a shoe that feels great. Um, one of the thing I would say, like there were some comments online that this shoe is like too overbuilt for faster speeds. I actually did a couple workouts in this shoe, like a couple like LT2 threshold workouts did like one like burnout interval at the end of a long run and it was fine. Like it, I, I didn't feel like any of like the build of the shoe got in the way of me running fast. So yeah, I think I agree with you. The foam absolutely can handle like lots of workout speeds. Like it's just, the shoe's just a little bit heavy. So a little bit, but, but like the foam itself actually like North face could cobble together like damn near a super shoe actually i bet north face could like right now make a marathon shoe as good as the brooks hyperion elite four mm. um with this foam like i think if they just threw a very thin outsole thinned out this upper and just dumped a carbon plate in it you have a shoe that can compete with at least the hyperion elite four which isn't saying a ton for current marathon super shoes but like that's pretty cool to have a foam that's at least that responsive yeah. and can handle that sort of work just in like what they're supposed to basically be like a junk miles trail shoe. Yeah. Um, which then had me thinking, so like, yeah, I, I totally agree with everything you say about the, the, the feel of the shoe where it's like, it can handle a very wide variety of paces. And I thought that was awesome, but it's not very soft. Part of me wished they tuned this foam a little bit softer. I wish they catered this shoe more towards the easy day, the long run, mm. you know, because this is supposed to complement the Vective Pro as your, you know, you do your like harder long runs and workouts in the Vective Pro, and then you do all your easy recovery days in this, but it's like the same durometer foam. Like, why not make this one a little bit more recovery oriented? Yeah. and and because like you said, you're like, yeah, I could hit workout paces in it. Like, no problem. Totally. Like, that's cool. But maybe that was actually then a problem for what the shoe is supposed to be for. Um, so like part of me wishes, like I would love to see what this shoe felt like with like a couple notches, softer foam. With that being said, I actually really liked, I've really enjoyed running in this shoe. Like we're getting into the best time of the year to run in Ashland. Like the trails are drying out. and it, flowers are starting to bloom and yeah. uh this shoe just cruises on like mellow dirt so well like interestingly i don't know if it's just i run better in the spring when it's a little warmer out but a lot of my standard loops out here i'm running a little bit faster at the same exact effort in this shoe versus some of the other ones that we've recently reviewed yeah and i think a lot of that is due to this nicely responsive foam and this very efficient rocker. Like I can feel that for my biomechanics, I run much more efficiently in this shoe than some of our less rocker, lower stack height, denser foam shoes that we've reviewed recently. So I really like the the shape of this midsole and you know the materials there. 
I think it would be, I think it would have been even better if it was just a little bit softer too. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's like it's like that shoe where you you go out with the intention of having a social day or easy or you're off or whatever, and then like four miles into the run, you're like, I feel amazing. I'm gonna rip some faster miles because this shoe is just like facilitating it. Yeah, and I love the fact that this shoe makes me feel that way, but I feel like it's almost then hitting missing the mark for what <laughs> what it's actually <laughs> supposed to be for, which is a good thing and a bad thing because. Uh, this was a really fun, this is one of the more fun maximal stack shoes that I've run in, in, in a while. Can you, can you tell the audience what you told me about how this shoe could be problematic if you have a smaller foot? So offline fit and I were talking about how, um, some people, so like a lot of women with smaller feet have issues with some of these max height, max stack shoes. And that got us to talking about how like fins size 12 is the same exact stack height as a women's like size six and a half. Um, some of the companies are reducing the stack a little bit for the women's shoes, like two or three millimeters, but it's not proportional. Hmm. Um, so like a women's size six in an also Mesa 500, that would be like you rocking like a 60 millimeter stack shoe out on the trails <laughs> and it's moon, moon boots. <laughs> uh, yeah. It just, I don't know. It kind of just, it, it led to some like interesting, just like some engaging thought in regards to like for varying heights and weights and size feet of people, what is the optimum stack height yeah. for you? Like for that person, like I feel like what the best stack shoe is for you is probably going to be very different than, you know, a lady who's like a size seven and weighs like 110 pounds. Um, I would just be curious to see like if there's any any biomechanics studies that have had have dove really deep into that like you know and then we got to talk we're like the nike alpha fly three what height weight size foot person was that shoe designed around like who is the optimal human for that shoe is it 510 150 is it 51 105 like I don't know. And that would, that would be a very interesting thing to dive deeper on, but, um, really interesting. Yeah. So I, I guess it's always something to take with a grain of salt in regards to like stack height of the shoe and that like a max more is definitely not always better. Um, that is super interesting that and I'm guessing it's most shoe companies, but like proportionality of features is not baked into the like release of every size. No. And, and that's really hard to do too. I mean, that's, that would be a, a very expensive process to not only yeah. make molds. I mean, of course, they already make the molds that are a different size, like you have the whole size run. But then if they were all actually slightly different stacks as well, I mean, maybe that's in the future for one of our like small niche companies like your Speedland, your Norda. That could be yeah. an opportunity for them to get an edge over some of these bigger companies. Okay, Finn, question for you asking the hard hitting questions here. Would you race in this shoe? Yeah, I was I was just thinking about this. I I think this is going to be one of the shoes that I keep and I'm very interested to So I, I think I might go to Western States training camp this year and sign oh, up yeah. and do like Robin, you know, the whole last 70 miles of the course just for fun and I might bring this shoe with me. I, I'm really curious to see how this shoe performs in that environment. I don't know if this is like a tip of the spear you know, top athlete type shoe for Western. But I feel like if you're in the middle of the pack, front of the middle of the pack, back of the front of the pack, and you want a reliable shoe, I think this shoe could perform really well on that course. I 100% agree. And I would absolutely race in this shoe. I would race Western States in this shoe. Like, you know, when we did our end of 2023 year episode, and it was like, if you had to pick one shoe from start to finish at Western States, like, what would it be? Um, I, I might've said Nike Zagama. I can't remember, but um, Alta Mesa 500, I'm absolutely putting on that short list because I very much could see this shoe lasting for that course. No problem. Like I would consider wearing this shoe for, you know, you're more runnable. Like it doesn't have to be flat. It can be a very verdy type course, but you know, the longer it is, the slower I'm going. So then the lockdown matters less, but anywhere in that 50 to hundred mile range of like a more runnable course, I I would not hesitate at all to throw this shoe on, especially because I'm still not totally sold on like 
I haven't found like a carbon plated trail shoe that I've loved so much where I'm like, this is hands down better. And I'm wearing, I need to wear this as something like Western States or else I'm, or else I'm just losing time. Like I don't, I haven't found a shoe like that yet. And I, I think for the sake of like staying healthy, this is one of those shoes that I feel like could help me reliably get through a hundred miles without getting hurt. This reminds me, this could, this could be a good question for the audience. Uh, what else would you add to the list of shoes that are actually like fairly high performance shoes disguised as recovery shoes? Yeah. Like, I don't know if that list is that long, but this is a hundred percent going on that list. It's like, <laughs> this is supposed to be a slow shoe, but North Face put fast foam in it. And for some reason it's pretty cool. The only thing is like, it just fits a little bit odd, but chances are it's going to be like good enough for you. Like I didn't have any blister problems. I never had to relace it. Um, so like the fit was fine. It's just like, well, just like, a, I don't know. I guess it was just like a little sloppy um, in the forefoot, which, yeah, that was the next, I guess that, that moves pretty seamlessly into this next category, which was like, what could be improved for version 2.0 of the shoe? And like, for me, that's the upper fit. I feel like the upper fit and maybe um, not even the materials, but maybe the placement of some of the overlays could just be a little bit more dialed in. And, you know, I think that's just a new shoe problem. I would not be surprised at all that if after a year of feedback and testing, um, they've already got this upper dialed in more. Um, like, shoot, dude, give me give me a ma- give me a thin matrix upper on this. Huh. And like we'll just call that like my ideal Western state shoe. Maybe a softer, softer experience in the midsole too. Yeah, I would I think a little bit softer midsole foam would be would make this shoe more approachable for those recovery days um and potentially without even sacrificing the the fun factor you know you make this softer and it's probably just a little bouncier and maybe you sacrifice 50 miles of durability but gosh if you add like 10 fun points whatever that metric means that would be very intriguing make the shoe uh make this foam softer it also actually probably gets a little bit lighter too because we're using a lower density foam so Agree on all friends. I think the one other thing I, I might add, uh, leak some fans of Ultra and Topo and make the forefoot a little bit more foot shaped. Like don't just Yeah. I don't think that's I don't think that ruins the ride quality at all to round out this toe box a little bit. Um Yeah, I don't I don't see any negatives to doing that because we're just rounding out the toe box. We're not making the shoe wider or anything like that. Um I thought it was very smooth. I, I was interested to see like I'm now that we've run in it. I thought it was, you know, a risky move by North Face to go right into that max stack, like non-plated high cushion category. Cause that's like probably one of the deepest categories of trail shoes right now that has some like very popular shoes. I mean, just to rattle off a few again, we're looking like Brooks Caldera 7, $150. Yep. Hoka Speed Go 5, $155. Asics Tribuco Max 3, $160. Nike Zagama. $160. North Face Ultimesa 500, $155. And it slots, you know, right, it slots right in there. Like, I think it, it can hold its own in that category. I liked the shoe enough where I feel super confident being like, yep, it can hold its own in that category. It's just a little heavier. It's probably like half an ounce heavier than the Caldera 7, I think. Yeah. I, I, I'd have to look back on my exact uh, I think weights, on my side, but it's half an ounce. Yeah. It's very, it's, it's yeah, it's close. It's definitely chonky for sure. In terms of the underfoot experience though, like this foam, I might like it the best of those ones that I just listed. Um, you know, I think the Speedgoat and the Tribuco Max are more comfortable, but I think this North Face is comfortable enough mm. to warrant me then putting it on because this midsole foam is awesome. I just never thought I would say North Face is making one of my favorite midsole foams, but they are actually. And that is so surprising. Shout out Brett Rivers. Dude, good job at Brett Rivers and team over at North Face for making one of my favorite trail midsole foams. And I'm really <laughs> excited to see this on more shoes because it's just a Vective Pro and this Ultimesa 500 right now. And I hope it trickles down to a few more. Maybe another question. How yeah. does this rank in, in terms of debuts for a shoe? Yeah, this is very high up there. Like this is, they did a great job. You know, there's definitely, it's not perfect. There's definitely things that can be improved, but there were no immediate deal breakers. 
mm. on this shoe. Like there's nothing where it made me be like, ah, oh, I got to put this shoe on. I have no hesitations every morning, lace these shoes up, get out the door. It was great. And from a value standpoint, you know, 155 for the shoe, I think what you get, what you get for 155 is great. Um, you know, the biggest my my biggest question mark I would say is durability of some of these smaller lugs in the forefoot. Um, you know, I have 76 miles on the shoe. I'm already starting to see some wear. You know, I imagine. Oh yeah, I can see like some of your like lateral heel lugs are getting a little shaved down. That's that's a like, lot of that's that your thing. My gait, though, you know my yeah, gait. Like... That's your thing. The durability of this outsole felt similar to that of like the GS Tam. The only reason I give it more of a pass here is because the shoe is $155 and not 275 It wouldn't surprise me at all if by 300 miles, especially running on like hard pack dry trails, if these four foot lugs were pretty flat by 300 miles, which... Mm. Some track if, trail, it's just a road shoe. <laughs> yeah, then it's just a road shoe, but the foam <laughs> might be packed out by then anyway. So I think it's like probably pretty medium on the durability scale, but for $155, I mean... I have no problem recommending the shoe to be like the workhorse for the bulk of your training miles. Um, what do you think? Agree. Yeah. I think, um, I'm, I'm excited to see this. Like, I don't know if, I don't even know if it's an emerging category, but just like all of these brands that are sort of like, I don't want to say racing to the bottom, but they're creating, you and I use the term budget a lot. Like they're creating this amazing budget option for recovery performance, whatever category in their lineup, which is amazing. And, well, that was one of my predictions. Budget is so we, hot right now. When we did our end of 2023 episode, I said it's going to get harder and harder to justify the two buying the $200 plus shoe because the mid range shoe is about to be so good yeah. this year. And like this Ultimesa 500 is proof that the mid range shoe is getting very, very good. And if you do want to try out the North Face Ultimesa 500 and you're local running shop does not have them feel free to use our link below to get the shoes from our friends at running warehouse uh yeah your purchase helps support the channel allows us to keep doing shoe reviews like this we're my mileage is finally starting to ramp back up um so i feel like we're gonna we're about to like preload a whole bunch of episodes <laughs> right now i mean what are we what are we about to have like a 400 mile 500 mile april totally how yeah. many miles are you gonna run in april finn I'll probably run, well, I've got the Antelope Island 50 on March 29th. I've got the Zion 100K on April 13th, and I've got Cocodona May 6th. So we're probably going to go through, I'll probably go through six shoes, seven yeah. shoes. And uh, for those who have been listening and watching this whole time, we really appreciate it. And for that, I will tell you what the next shoe we review is, and that is going to be the On Cloud Surfer Trail. Another, uh, actually, another shoe that's like right in that, mid price right. mid price uh, door to trail type category very exciting <laughs>